Thank you, Mauro, for your invitation and to the Academy. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here back in Rio, wonderful city, as always, one of the best places to be, one of the best cities in the world. Uh, thank you again for honoring me with giving me enough time to cover both HCV as well as HBV cure. That's what we're talking about today, cure, not treatment. And that's what's important. So I work at Emory University. I'm a professor there. I've been there for 39 years. And I'll try and go slowly for the, try and go slowly. I'm not, I usually speak very fast for the, so that the translator can, uh, can do her job. Or, so if I go too fast, just uh, wave at me. Uh, okay, so what you can see on the slide actually is my building. Uh, that's what happens when you're successful. You can buy your own building, and that's what I've done. Uh, and uh, Mauro visited my lab. Uh, we have the penthouse, the top part. It's a $90 million building uh, at Emory University, and we spent a lot of time on the top floor discovering, developing new drugs for many infectious diseases, in particular now, of course, with emerging viruses like Zika and other, comp other nasty viruses that affect human beings. Uh, so I'm going to cover today uh, because I've been asked to talk about how we discovered, actually, sofosobir. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the potency of the drug and the effectiveness of the drug, because I think everybody knows it's pretty effective, and give you a bit of historical perspective, and then move on to hepatitis B, because I think this is the next challenge uh, for everybody. There's more than 450 million people infected with hepatitis B uh, globally. It's much more than HIV, HIV and HCV combined. So this is, I think, the new frontier and where we need to be today is to find a cure for hepatitis B virus, and I'll talk about that too. I'm going to wave when I need the next slide so I can have the next slide. Let me go through the drugs very quickly. I think you're familiar with some of these drugs if you're a clini clinician. If not, you've heard about them in the newspaper. Uh, some of the five fundamental drugs that are at the top uh, you can see D4T, stavudine, 3TC, lamivudine, FTC, which is uh, used in many, many combinations today. Telbivudine is also was a drug that I was in, involved in, invented. And of course, sofosovir, which is probably the most famous one, because not only does it treat, but it also cures. And from these drugs, sons and daughters came about. Because, as you know, with antiviral agents, you can get resistance, so, and sometimes the potency is not enough, so you have to combine them. So a number of drugs with funny names, like Ebzicom, uh, Trisivir, and so on, have come out, and they are now used widely uh, by many patients who are infected with both HIV, uh, with HIV, HBV, or HCV. And in some cases, actually, some people have all three viruses in them. So you have to be careful how you dose these uh, these, uh, these drugs. In fact, uh, it's been recently reported, for example, that people who take HCV drugs have to be careful because they can get reactivation of hepatitis B virus, and therefore you need to monitor that. So we are really, although I'm a PhD, I'm an interface of biology and medicine, and uh, as you'll see, I even designed my clinical trials. Next slide. So it all started with HCV back in 1975, when Stephen Feinstein at NIH, working with Harvey Alters and Robert Purcell and others, uh, basically discovered there was an HC, a virus that was called at the time non-A, non-B, because we knew about H HPV and, and, uh, uh, and clearly we knew, about H H uh, we knew about HBV and we knew about a hep hepatitis A virus but there was a large proportion of patients that didn't re react serologically to either B or C, uh, B or A. So basically, they came up with what they called non-A, non-B. Very smart, I guess. And this was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Next slide. It didn't take very long, approximately 20 few years later, 25 years later, Mike Houghton, and his colleagues at CDC, at CDC, Bradley, Dan Bradley, and others, came out in science in 1989, uh, basically describe what we now today know as HCV. And we know there's about 64 to 170 million people infected globally with hepatitis C virus. And the, the, uh, it's all due to the advent of molecular biology 
the ability to sequence virus, and that allowed us to sequence hepatitis C virus and identify it as hepatitis C. And from that day on, it was called hepatitis C. It's remarkable that in another 25 years, we now have a cure for hepatitis C. Not a treatment, a cure, which is extremely effective. And this was only done thanks to the advent of a uh, cell culture system called an HCV replicon system in the early 1990, which transformed HCV to drug discovery in academia and industry. So I rest on the shoulders of many scientists and use their technology and also the advent of real-time PCR. Remember, we're now 1990. Real-time PCR was just beginning. And we took the gamble and bought a machine which cost something like $80,000, $900,000. It was a big risk, but that helped us quantitate virus very rapidly and also measure toxicity at the same time. So this was a turning point, having the Replicon system as well as real-time PCR. Next slide. And thanks to that, we discovered a number of compounds, and I'll tell you how we discovered them, give you an idea of what was done. Uh, we know before the early stage, just after the discovery of hepatitis C, people took interferon, which you know has a lot of side effects. And then they improved it, the interferon, by taking riba with interferon, ribavirin, not very good. And you can see the SVR, what we call sustained virological response, this is a term hepatologists, gastroenterologists use. It's a form of saying a cure. But they don't dare say the word cure, but it is a cure. And they usually measure sustained virological response, say, at four weeks, at six weeks, at 12 weeks. And the standard for a cure is 12 weeks. So that's the lingo that they use, the language that they use. So you can see what happened in 2011. You now have the advent of Bersepravir and telapavir, these are protease inhibitor, very potent, but of course a lot of side effects, and the SVR increased to the 67 to 75% range. And then, now we, are in, we entered in 2013, actually December 2013, we entered into the, uh, what we call the very potent antiviral agent, the DAAs, uh, that basically transform uh, this disease to a cure with very high rate of close to 90%. And now that we have all DAA combination, we're up to today about 98% cure rate. So it's quite phenomenal what's happened in very limited time. I don't think I've ever seen anything in the history of medicine where you take a, a discovery of virus, find treatments, they're not very good, and then find a cure for it. And it's the first time in history that we have drugs that actually can cure a viral disease very first time in history. Next slide. So what we've learned is, is that we don't really need interferon alpha or riba anymore, except maybe in some case, very few cases, uh, riba can be used, but interferon is out. And uh, the beauty of this treatment is that you, especially if you have a pangenotypic treatment, is that you do not need to monitor the patients, except when you bring them in and then when you stop treatment and monitor what happens if the virus rebounds or there's any viral load. So it simplifies the treatment and therefore you can treat many more patients if you can afford these drugs, unfortunately. They're quite expensive. Uh, contraindication to treatment are relatively rare, but remaining challenges, especially when you have cirrhosis. Uh, F4 cirrhosis, you need more powerful drugs and longer treatment sometimes. And reinfection following HCV cure is also important, therefore, we heard yesterday about vaccines. I still believe that we need a vaccine for hepatitis C virus because once we cure these people, we need to vaccinate them so they never get infected again, especially among drug, drug abusers. I think, and this is where I'd like to make stress and my talk is gonna focus on that today, short duration is definitely advantageous in the real world. Uh, many studies have come out that shorter duration of treatment is beneficial to the patients and they're not exposed to drugs unnecessarily. And obviously, it would also decrease the cost because you don't have to treat for 12 weeks. I think a lot of the patients who are treated today with the drugs that we have are over-treated. And the 12 weeks, by the way, is all arbitrary. It was not really uh, based on science. Uh, so I can go into that in more detail. And of course, there are the generics. And some countries, 
have developed generics. Some have worked with the companies, various companies, to develop uh, GMP generics. And let's allow them to give them to countries like Egypt, where they have a prevalence of about 13% population infected with hepatitis C virus. And that's provide, and also providing these drugs at low cost, depending on the GDP of the country. Now we're getting to the era of ultra short treatment. I'm going to show you what we've done, and we pioneered that to improve adherence, reduce costs, simplify treatment, reduce exposure to drug, and more affordable, increase access towards global eradication of HCV. I strongly believe that we will need ultra short treatments in order to eradicate this virus from the face of the earth. It's not 12 weeks, maybe too long, and not that effective uh, in terms of global eradication. That's why we, we, we need to talk about. Next slide. So there are many drugs that have been developed and still more are being developed, and I'll show you some of them in a minute. But really, there are three major classes, what we call the Previrs, the Asvirs, and the Buvirs. And these are three different classes of drug, the NS3-4 protease inhibitors, the most famous one is Simeprivir, the first approved at the same time as Sovaldi. The NS5A inhibitors, the most famous one is Daclasavir. That was the very first one uh, that is pangenotypic, quite pangenotypic and very good drugs, but unfortunately they don't have anything to combine it. They don't have the nukes to combine it with this drug, but there are many other drugs that are now pangenotypic which are NS5A inhibitors. That's a huge discovery by the people at Bristol Myers uh, Squibb, and I give them credit for discovering this class of compounds, which was totally unexpected. Of course, the NS5B is where I focus on, because I'm a nucleoside chemist and biologist, and sofosfavir was the most famous one, but there are others in development. Uh, I also was involved with Idenix Pharmaceutical, the IDX compound, which eventually the, drug, the, co the company was sold to Merck. But there are other companies involved, like Achillion and also j and that are involved in development of nucleosides, polymerase inhibitors. But there's only one today that's been approved by the FDA. There are many other opportunities to target hepatitis C virus, and I mentioned some of them at the top there in yellow. But really, these are way behind, especially with the advent of such potent and pangenotypic compounds that we'll hear, talk about in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So this is roughly the history in terms of approval uh, of these drugs. I'm not going to go into details. What I would like to say is that finally, in April of this year, so, uh, Harvoni, which is a combination of two drugs, Sofosavir plus Ledipasavir, was actually approved in children. I think that's a big, big improvement. And the imposed in children were basically neglected. And there's quite a few children who are infected with hepatitis C because we've now shown definitively that virus can be transmitted from the mother to the child. So we have an opportunity to now cure these children very early on. And of course, the quality of life for these children that are going to live maybe 60 years or 50 years, they benefit immensely by treating them early. And that's why I think it's important to have uh, drugs available for children, not just the adults and not just the very sick. Nucleoside analogs are the best in class because they have high potency, remarkable potency. We can get up to five log drop in virus. I wish we had nucleoside for HIV that gave you five log drop. You don't see that. They're pangenotypic, work against all six genotypes. They have high barrier to resistance. In fact, you can select in the lab resistant virus to drugs like sofosfavir, but in the clinic, the virus is very debilitated. You do have a signature mutation, it's an S282T, and that mutation is very, very rare. And as I mentioned, the virus is uh, not fit, not very fit, not very fit, so you basically go back and you, um, um, the virus goes back to wild type very quickly. And what we want, of course, is low, uh, low pill burden and the drug being orally bioavailable. Next slide. So these are basically the characteristics when you try to discover a drug for not just for H HCV, but also for HIV or any other, other uh, virus infection. You need to obviously look at the potency of the drug, the resistance profile, the efficacy against different clades or pangenotypes, having pangenotypic pan efficacy. You have to look at adverse events. Obviously, you want a very safe drug. And also, you need to look at drug-drug interaction. 
This is actually quite important because a lot of these people, are, as I mentioned, are co-infected. So you may get drug-drug interaction. What you want is basically all green, which means a good profile. And for nucleosides, we've achieved that very quickly. But the other drugs, as time goes on now, we have second generation NS5A, and you can see a bit more green, a bit more yellow. And also, very recently, and I mentioned one of the compounds a bit later in my talk, we have now uh, an, uh, NS5B non-nucleosides inhibitor that have very favorable profile for the first time. And that's really quite exciting because these drugs can now be used for salvage therapy or for triple or quadruple combination chemotherapy. Next slide. So the ultimate goal, of course, we, we can do all these things, but the ultimate goal is to increase the lifespan and quality of life of the people infected with hepatitis C virus. Next slide. And now I'm going to talk briefly about how we discovered sofosavir. It wasn't easy, it wasn't trivial. I mentioned we need to invest in real-time PCR. We need to have a library of compounds. Uh, and we were fortunate to have a library at the time. And very early on, we discovered that a compound called, it's like a nucleoside, it's like cytosine, but it's got a two prime fluoro moiety at the two prime position. So the two prime position is a fluorine, as you can see. And that compound, we published on it back in 2004 and demonstrated that it had antiviral activity. Uh, we were surprised. And that obviously gave us the idea of looking at multiplication at two prime position. We looked at drugs like gemcitabine, and that also has antiviral activity, but as you know, it's an anti-cancer agent. It's not a terribly toxic compound, but nevertheless, you know, it can reduce viral load, but not very efficiently. So it did demonstrate that these dihalogenated compounds had anti-HCV activity. About the same time, another company I founded discovered that the two prime methyl in the up position with the hydroxy intact for the cytosine moiety, the compound called NM107, was also antiviral, but weak antiviral, but nevertheless it had antiviral activity. So the idea was, why don't we combine, as a medicinal chemist, the two properties, the two prime fluoro with the two prime methyl. And through that work, we discovered a compound called 6130, which is shown on the right hand side. Next slide. So here is where a bit of good science and serendipity occurred. When you study the cellular pharmacology of this compound, you get radio label or use mass spectrometry, look at uh, pulse the, the compound in cells, liver cells, and you can see the phosphorylation to the monophosphate, diphosphate, and triphosphate. And when you look at the triphosphate, you can measure the affinity for the polymerase, the HCV polymerase, and also measure the half-life of the drug intracellularly. And 6130 had a KI of about 0.05 and a half-life of only five hours. Now, when we did monkey studies, actually I did monkey studies at Emory, we discovered that the compound 6130 was rapidly deaminated to the uracil analog, which was essentially inactive with an EC90 of greater than 100 micromolar. So we were worried about that because we said, wow, if this happens in humans, we will not have a good drug. 6130 will not be a good drug. Fortunately, there's differences between mammalian, different mammalian uh, cytidine deaminases, which is the enzyme responsible for the deamination of the C compound to the U compound. But then we went on and studied this further cellular pharmacology, and we discovered that the P6130 was monophosphorylated, and the monophosphate, not the drug itself, but the monophosphate, was, dia was deaminated to the 6206 monophosphate. And that was further phosphorylated, and the triphosphate had a KI not as effective, not as good as 6130, but it has a very long half-life. So that's where the eureka, mo uh, eureka moment occurred. Thanks to cellular pharmacology, and thanks to a wonderful a uh, cellular pharmacologist and biochemist by the name of Murakami, who now works at Gilead. He basically described all this and published on it in antimicrobial agent chemotherapy back in 2007. So it didn't take very long, 2007. Uh, 2004, we discovered 6130. 2007, we now discover the, what is becoming the precursor and active moiety of sofosavir, which is known as PSI 6206. So it became pretty obvious what to do next. And the next step was to try and find a way to deliver the, monofo the, mon the uridine monophosphate 
this molecule here intracellularly. If you could do that, then you can have a compound that has a longer half-life, can be given once a day, and have a reasonably good KI. And that's how the discovery occurred. So we used technology that was already available on the shelf, developed many years earlier by a guy called McGeegan at Cardiff University. So we didn't really have to invent anything. Next slide. And we made this phosphonate, phosphonate prodrug. And as you know, because phosphorus is chiral, you can have an S form and you have, and have an R form. And when you test the two forms in the replicon system, you see there's a difference in potency with the S isomer being more potent than the R, than the R isomer. And also, you can see that the affinity for the mutated en enzyme in the polymerase 282 is lower, which means the compound is better for, si seven, uh, for 6130, uh, what became, what was, um, sorry, 7977, which is basically sofosphere. So therefore, sofosphere was actually selected for clinical trials based on, this on these data. We actually made a prodrug that eventually the drug was take, can be taken orally, go to the liver, break down in the liver, and deliver the monophosphate form of the U analog. And that's basically the way sophosphory works. And this was the, the drug, the, the multi-billion dollar drug that was discovered. Next slide. And again, I'm not going to spend time telling you what sophosphory does in humans. I think you know already. But to me, what's exciting now today is to how to truncate therapy as for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And, you know, people worry about truncation because they say, wow, you know, you're going to take a risk. The virus is going to become resistant. You're going to have to retreat patients who don't respond, uh, all these things. But remember, if you now go down to a three-week treatment or a four-week treatment, that means you can economize significant, significantly but also, you can always retreat again, and it's still going to be cheaper than treating for 12 weeks. So if you find the right regimen, the right combinations, you can definitely uh, go for a short duration uh, therapy. I'm going to talk about this for the rest of my talk. Next slide. Next slide. So you can see people have tried that. We weren't the, the geniuses, the first people to think about this. Many people tried and failed. When they went down to four weeks, you can see the SVR is down very low. So about 27% SVR at, at, week tw at week 12. If you go six weeks, you can do it. The SVR is about 93%, depending on what drugs you take. Uh, and this is work, uh, work done by GAIN in, a, in New Zealand, uh, showing, uh, showing what can happen with just by shortening duration of treatment. So they've tried many, many, many ways of getting down to four weeks and basically failed, because that's not a good result. Next. So, we decided, because nobody else seems to want to do these studies, this is an academic center, coupling with a group in Hong Kong, George Lau, who's a gastroenterologist, one of the best in China. We decided to try a, combina a study, which we call SODAPI, which was published last year in Lancet Gastrohepatology. And the reason why we selected this, the genotype 1B, we didn't have many choices, because most of the people in China have this genotype. About 5.7 million report, reportedly have uh, this genotype. And the current recommendation is pan-oral DAA. In fact, only recently, for 12 weeks, only recently did the DAA has become available, only last, I think last week or the week before, in China, the limited number, soft, uh, soft DAC, but soft is not yet approved. So they're using still interferon with, DA, with a DAA. And this is the problem. So we decided to try not just four weeks, we decided to go three weeks. Next slide. So here's the setup that we did. We divided uh, 26 Chinese naive genotype 1 subjects into three groups. And we measured what we call rapid virological response. And it's actually super rapid. It's at day two. We measured if they had less than 500 international units per ml of virus. We, continue, we continued the treatment for three weeks and stopped. If they didn't have less than 500 uh, international units per ml, we just gave them the full course, the 12-week course. So of, and we divided the subject into three groups, soft, lidipasvir, asunaprevir, soft, daclasivir, asunaprevir, 
sulfataclasavir, asunapravir. By the way, this is all done blindly. All subjects actually followed, achieved SVR 12 after three weeks of treatment, un very, very unusual, <coughs> including those that took, the, just for three weeks, we were able to get 100% cure rates using these particular therapies, using the, what we call response-guided therapy. And as I mentioned, this was not funded by pharma, this was funded by academic centers entirely because nobody wanted to take the risk to do the study, and we did it and demonstrated to the world that it is possible to shorten duration of treatment, particularly in the 1B patients. Next slide. This actually showed you the viral kinetics, and this basically destroyed all the ideas that people had about virus kinetics for HCV previously, work by, done by Perelson and others. All wrong. Everything is wrong. And the reason is they didn't take into, into account the immune, intact immune system in these people. So the immune system actually works with you and the drug. And you can see the best combination was the one with the blue triangles was basically soft DAC sim. And you can see the, the cost. But they all, by, by week two, two of the group had achieved 100% SVR. By week three, 100% had achieved SVR. And at Obviously, at 12 weeks, we also got 100% SVR. So it was a bit boring. We got cured everybody. And this was a pilot study, but clearly it opens the opportunity to look at other, other combinations and even perhaps go down to two weeks and maybe even one week. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there are many studies that have been tried for shorter duration treatment. Most of them have tried six weeks. Some have tried four weeks. They failed miserably. The best one is the one, our paper demonstrated that we can do it because the problem is that these companies use what I call incestuous combinations, meaning they are using their own drugs rather than you combining the best drugs from different companies. And this is something I urge Brazil to consider to get the best drugs possible for the Brazilian people, not to just take whatever they've given to you by Gilead or some other company you should even make your own formulation if you have to. Next slide. So we now have options. Again, we want to shorten even further. further. We can use pangenotypic NS5B nukes, which we have, pangenotypic NS5A, which we have, and most recently we have pangenotypic NS5B and an I, and I'll show you that. We are one of the, one of the people, one of the groups that has that in the clinic right now. We're also developing helicase inhibitors, pangenotypic helicase, that's next. So how do we do this? How do we get these drugs? Next, next. So this is roughly uh, how we discover these, these non-nucleoside drugs, because nucleosides of it is a bit of an art, uh, more than a science, but when you have now the discovering drugs that bind to a particular receptor or particular enzyme, you can actually use rational drug design. And our work is studying, we do co-crystallization. So we have, uh, we can get the enzyme, highly pure, we, uh, the basic X-ray quality crystals production, mon monitor and, and look at the drug pocket selection, and then we design the drugs to fit into the pocket. We can then lead optimize it so that the drug is not, is harder to get resistant virus, and also, uh, it's pangenotypic, so you can do two things to maximize uh, the efficacy of the drug that you're designing. Low, high barrier to resistance, and uh, so the high, high barrier to resistance is one of the, one of the things that we, we want, and pangenotypic is the other thing we want. And then we get, obviously, a drug candidate, and there's many things we have to do before we get to the point where we uh, call this drug ready to go into humans. Next slide. So we can, we have actually crystallized the NS5B polymerase of genotype one to six. These are not fake pictures. These are actually real pictures of the crystals. <laughs> so it's not made up, you know. So for, and we can actually study them, the, the, look at the active site and see how the molecules bind in the pocket. And from that, we came up with a compound. Next slide. Next slide which had this characteristics. We call it CD1244. You can see it's active against genotype you know, 1, B, uh, 1A, 1, 1B, uh, 3A, 4A, 5A. We don't have the 6. 
but you can see clearly it's a nanomolar inhibitor across oh, a nanomolar or, or, uh, or uh, 20, 20 nanomolar or so co uh, compound compared to sofosvir, similar profile, even better in some cases. And the greatest fold resistance uh, change we got was about uh, less than, it was less than six fold. So you see we have this compound, and then we, we did a lot of work, I'm not gonna go into details because I don't have time, typical drug discovery, toxicity, uh, inter drug interactions, uh, drug combination, and so on. And then we went into humans. So next slide, showing you the results in humans. So I'm jumping, this is, I'm jumping quickly. Here is the, no, I didn't touch anything, so go back please. Okay, good. So this is actually the human study. We selected other doses. I'm showing you just the 200 and the 400 milligrams. One is 200 milligrams BID twice a day and 400 milligrams QD. And you can see the profound antiviral effect this NNI, it's not a nucleoside, has. We were totally surprised by the results we got. The results are similar for the 200 milligrams BID or 400 milligrams QD, so clearly we're going to go there. And you can see there's also a post-antibiotic effect. We treat for seven days, and then we stop treatment, and then we monitor the virus rebound, and it's actually coming up. This is monotherapy, okay? So you can imagine what you're gonna get. Now, I put things in perspective, you say three log, big deal. But nobody had ever, before that time, demonstrated the drug, and NNI can actually do that. Next slide. If you look at the, next slide, if you look at the competitors, the Supervir, which is an Abbott drug, uh, approved by the FDA, it works against genotype one only. It doesn't work against other genotype. You're giving it BID, and the best results you get is about one log. Another one, Tegobavir, genotype one, BID, high dose, high dose from, uh, uh, and it's all BID, BID, and the most you can get is again one log. With our drug, we're getting, it's pangenotypic, it's a QD drug, and we get three log drops. So we're very pleased about this because I think this particular drug has a very good safety profile and can be useful for ultra short therapy and also for salvage therapy for hepatitis C virus. As you know, some people even today, you hear about 98%, 95%, some people don't respond and you need to treat them for a longer period, but the other way to do it is to add another drug like this one because, and that with a different mechanism. And this, has, this is the first one that I know that gives you three log drop in humans with a high safety profile. So we're now conducting studies on combination chemotherapy, which we'll do again, uh, and see what, how this drug uh, interact with Eplusa, with Harvoni, and other combinations. Next slide. So just to sum up the HCV story, as of last month, we cured glo probably globally about two million people. This is an estimate, it's not accurate. Uh, there's still failures, but but the great majority of the, patient, of the people who had HCV and took the drug, about two million. And you, there I'm counting also Egypt, which has a very high levels, a very high prevalence of hepatitis C virus. We think that the, the, the problem in the US at least, and probably globally, will persist until 2036. It's not gonna go away. They talk about 20 years from now, that by 2030, I don't think so because we're getting a lot more, a lot of people reinfection, a lot of reinfection with drug addicts and so on. And also we have populations including the people in prisons and also new, new infections and also now as I mentioned the babies from mothers, clearly this is feeding additional people who are not being treated immediately and uh, unless they file a lawsuit or something but clearly, there's a need there to also treat uh, people who are in prison if they want to be treated uh, voluntarily uh, uh, with, with the drugs that we have today. So I think the problem will persist a long time with the current regimens that we have. If we have shorter duration of treatment, I think we can, we can really have a big impact and make it a lot easier. Next slide. So I think we've come a long way from the discovery of non-A, non-B. Uh, Hep C solution is one of the greatest success story in human medical history, no question about it. The protagonists are getting better and better. We have very good drugs. We started with Silvaldi, combination, pangenotypic drugs, shorter treatment, eventually nanoparticles, and 
all that results in increased life, life expectancy for people. I think nanoparticles and shorter treatment will offer an efficient and convenient way to reduce cost and increase adherence. A topic I have not discussed today is treatment as prevention. If you treat enough people, you will have a herd effect and you'll stop transmission of the virus, a bit like you do with vaccines. So I think this is really an opportunity for us to test this hypothesis in certain countries, including Brazil. We're testing it in, Arme in, uh, in Georgia, the Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia, not, uh, not my Georgia in the US. And I think treatment as prevention is the way to go eventually and to, for global elimination and eventual eradication. And we, young people in the audience, I strongly urge you to think, when you have a problem, to think more about curing the disease than treatment. Uh, I want to banish the word treatment from the vocabulary. We don't want band-aids, we want actually cures for many diseases, not just HCV. And if you look at the future, what I like to see, next slide, is we have Zithromax, a, a CPAC, uh, a ZPAC, as you know, we call it ZPAC in the, in the United States. Why not a CPAC? Why not a drug that you can take for a few days, five days, let's say, very potent combination, and you cure the person, or having one pill, one cure, very quickly for global HCV eradication. That's, that's the huge cost saving. I think it's possible to do it. Nobody's tried the quad pills. Nobody's tried the putting the best, most potent drugs together. This virus doesn't have a long half-life. We can clear it. We can clear it probably in less than a week, I'm pretty sure. Even the reservoirs, like the people think it's in the brain rather than the liver, I think it's possible. So that's the future, that's where we go. Now I'm gonna turn over to the next uh, part of my talk, which is, which is basically hepatitis B. I mentioned people don't talk about hepatitis B much, and the reason why they don't talk about it is because we have a vaccine. But as I mentioned, there's over 400 million people infected with hepatitis. We talk about Zika, we talk about Ebola, we talk about HIV, but that's peanuts compared to hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is really one of the biggest killer and unlike HCV, it can, the virus can transform your liver quickly to hepatocytic carcinoma with no warning. You don't have the fibrosis F1, F2, F3, F4. You can get that, but usually it just goes straight to cancer and you can need a liver transplant. So there is a, there is a need for curing this disease. Next slide. So if I look at the world, you can see where the high prevalence are. Of course, Africa is high. Uh, United States, not that, big, not that big, but China is also a big, a big country where there's a big high prevalence. There are drugs available, some of them I invented, but they have to be given for life. And if you stop treatment, the virus rebounds and can kill you. And I mentioned 400 million estimate to be chronically infected worldwide. And what's interesting is two thirds of the cases are in poor and developing countries, including Brazil. So even on existing therapy, infected individuals can develop chronic liver disease, liver cirrhosis, and hepatocytic carcinoma, which is deadly and requires liver transplant, which is very costly, as you know. So this is where we are today. So we embarked on trying to find a cure for hepatitis C. Next slide. So is HPV eradication possible? Ten years ago, people thought I was crazy, but I thought it's possible. And next, next, but there's an uh, American science fiction writer who said everything is theoretically impossible until done. And that's, that's an important point. And the French have a saying, impossible n'est pas français, which means impossible is not French. Maybe you can say Brazilian too, because Brazilian are bold people. They, they, they try the impossible. Uh, so clearly, I think it is possible, but we, we still have to probe and see and do good science and drive this process until we have a cure. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go into great details about the replication cycle of hepatitis B. The virus gets in, gets into the nucleus. You have, to, you have all these things happening. Uh, what you need to know is there is a, a major reservoir of hepatitis B in the cells. It's actually in the nucleus. And it's called CCC DNA. It has a very long half-life. You can see it here. This little thing, squiggly colorful thing here. It's called CCC DNA. So that's the reservoir for the virus, very, putting it very simply. I know a lot of you are not scientists in the audience, so put it very simply. 
And it's not affected by nukes. All the drugs that are currently available doesn't have any impact. The only one that has an impact possibly is interferon, but only you have to treat for a whole year, and you, maybe you get between 1 and 5% of the patients will clear the virus, clear surface antigen, clear E antigen, and so on. The problem with the ccDNA, it's a way, it's a Xerox machine. It actually replenishes the, the DNA in the cells and also make new particles. There's also another problem with hepatitis B, and that is the integrated uh, 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 virus. So you got part of the virus integrated in the human genome, like HIV. That makes it a bit more difficult, but people believe that the, the virus that's integrated is archival. It doesn't come back. It doesn't come out like HIV. So there's a bit of debate about this, but you still can produce surface antigen from, from this archival DNA. So that's a big debate right now. That if, we, if we believe that there is a problem there in terms of integration, and the virus can be made from integrated HPV, we're, we're really in trouble. It's going to be very difficult. But I think, I think most of the science leads to the point that this virus, once integrated, doesn't come out. So it's archival. And there are very few therapies that will impact CCDNA. I mentioned only, only uh, uh, interferon. Just have capsids, it's like the coating. If you disrupt that, you open up the, everything that's inside it to the elements, enzymes and so on, and you get destruction. There's another class of drugs called sulfamol carboxamide, the HAP compounds. They're all known. Uh, the most potent compound to date that's actually in clinical trials is GLS-4, which was discovered by a Chinese group. And we work with them to advance this compound forward towards the clinic. Next slide. And you can look at the effect, the impact of these drugs like GLS-4 on CCDNA. You can actually measure CCDNA. Of course, you don't want to confuse the CCDNA with the, with the uh, viral uh, DNA. So you have to eliminate the viral, the viral and measure just CCCDNA. You can see the impact. There is an impact in terms of log reduction of CCCDNA in cells treated with GLS-4. Uh, Next slide. Uh, so there are basically, we, we decided to do a screening of and design new compounds. So I mentioned the HAP analogs. I mentioned the sulfamol benzamides. And we actually started working on a new class called glyoxamide pyrolamidine. This is roughly the structure here, shown here. I'm not going to show you the whole structure, but this is, gives you an idea of what the compound is. And we call them GLPs, GLPs for short, glyoxamide pyrolimidines. And we worked for about five years on this, trying to find one capsid inhibitor. And next slide, out of the 300 or so compounds, we found one called GLP-26 that was active at three nanomolar in culture and no toxicity, and you can see the therapeutic index is very high. And this compound was significantly more potent than the preceding compounds. This 3TC, the drug I invented, HAP12 and GLS4, you can see it's much more potent in culture. So that's great, but so what? Does it have any impact on capsid? Does it work like a capsid inhibitor? That's the next question. Or is it just pure luck? It just affects the DNA or something else. Next slide. So there's a marker for CCDNA, and that is the E antigen. So you can measure E antigen in cells. And you can see, if you measure the drug, like 3TC, which is a nucleoside analog, you don't see much of an impact on HPE antigen secretion inhibition. GLS-4, you see an impact with dose response. HAP-12, you see a response, and with a new compound. And when you calculate the EC50, you find it's almost ident it's identical to what you see in culture. It's about 3 nanomolar. So you have a 3 nanomolar inhibitor of capsid inhibition based on this, on this data. So we have data looking at the amount of CCDNA produced, but also E antigen production. Okay, so that's very nice, but show me, show me how it's working. Show me that it's actually doing something on the capsid. Next slide. Next. So we did some studies. So we take the HBV capsid 149, and we incubate it with a drug. This is a high concentration nevertheless, but we wanted to see first what happens. Uh, and then we induce assembly of the virion by adding salt, high concentration of salt, and we get the nice, the nice capsid formation. And then you can take this and go in the electron microscope, and this is just the vehicle alone with a diameter of 30 nanometers. With GLS-4, 
You get misassembly and hollow spheres. You can see them here, they're all hollow. And diameters between 80 and 100. And then with our compound, you can see that we have even smaller particle formed, incomplete hollow spheres, low abundance, and we have a diameter of less than 20 nanomolars. If you don't believe me, let's go to the next slide. Next slide, you can see now what, we, what I saw, the broken capsid. It's very dramatic. You can see that very clearly what happens with GLS-4 uh, as an example. And we can measure, we can actually see and quantitate all this if we wish to. Next slide. I have a lot more data. This is now what happens with GLP-26. Not as dramatic, not the broken eggshell, but the particles are definitely smaller, as you can see. So we, we really believe that this compound does work as a capsid inhibitor. I don't know who's caught talking there, but anyway. Next slide. So I'm going to go through, this is probably my almost last slide. Uh, what we've demonstrated is that GLP-26 inhibits HPV DNA like the nucleosides, but also uh, HPS antigen secretion and CCC DNA amplification at nanomolar concentration with no apparent toxicity. It interferes with capsid formations as I just showed you. And what I didn't show you is not only does it prevent, uh, it breaks down the capsid, but also it, it prevents the assembly of the capsid. So you have the assembly and you have also, I have data for that as well. So there's two mechanisms by which these compounds work. We have a long stability in dogs and human plasma, good liver microsomal stability. We have synergistic activity with entecavir, so ideally you want to block two pathways uh, to, to completely eradicate uh, hepatitis B. Uh, we have ox uh, amazing, these compounds are highly orally bioavailable, close to 100% orally bioavailable in, uh, in mice. We have not, not done any other, animal, any other uh, species yet. And uh, the activity has actually been demonstrated in a chimeric humanized liver mice system, actually working with people at Pasteur Institute. We showed up to 3.5 block drop decline, so actually the drug does work, and now we need to do more work. So we really have one of the most potent and selective HPV inhibitor of this class, in my opinion. So I'll, st I'll stop here, but I'll go to the next slide. I think we're almost done. So I do believe more work. We will be able to eliminate HPV as possible, especially if academia works with public health, industry, regulatory agency, and the government. We have the tools. We need to have the willpower to make this a priority, to make it happen. And together, we can really make a difference. So with that, I'm going to uh, say goodbye. Next slide. And thank my collaborators, particularly my group at Emory University, where I have quite a large group of people, my colleagues, at Los Alamos and also at, uh, uh, at Humanity in Hong Kong. Dr. Rabi, who's in the audience, thank you, Dr. Rabi, for coming. Uh, a microbiologist who helped us a lot with Soposavir in the early days. Dr. Hélène strick marchand at Pasteur, and of course the team at Coke Crystal. And just in case you didn't know, I, I am the founder, chairman, and major shareholder of Coke Crystal, just as my conflict of interest. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.